Anyway, what I'd like to talk a little bit about is how he applied some of these, these, this conceptual framework to studying dolphin whistle communication. I emphasize whistle communication because, of course, as Vincent pointed out, there's a number of different kinds of vocalizations that dolphins produce. Uh, and we specifically wanted to focus on whistle communication because of its relative ease to classify. And I say that with a big grain of salt because we'll be talking about this uh, over the next four days as well. Um, and so what, um, first of all, just, you know, again, just very briefly, one of the reasons why we we'll study dolphins is we know that they have a large brain size with a, um, a high encephalization quotient. Uh, they are known to have cross-modality in terms of vision and echolocation. They are known to understand syntax of language. They produce their own cognitive toy objects. And they are also no, known to be self-aware, as well as having a huge amount of research, decades and decades of research, both at Monkey Maya and Sarasota, on the complexity of dolphin uh, social organization. And so one of the questions that came up in our research group is whether or not the communication systems of dolphins might reflect this kind of, this kind of complexity. And we were particularly interested in looking at the level of the repertoires, or the, the non-signature calls, if you will, and how they might be structured in order to represent this kind of complexity that we see in their social behavior. And this is based on work, just so you know, that we did in the, in the mid to, to late 1990s. And we are currently following up with uh, another, uh, another large data set. So what I'd like to talk first about is some of the issues, and I think many of you have already brought these kinds of things up, with respect to studying vocal sequences um, and, and analyzing them effectively in uh, animals such as dolphins. And of course, call categorization seems to be number one on our list. I think there's going to be a lot of discussion about that. And that includes metrics to be used, um, perceptual saliency to the animals themselves, and even, even down to the kinds of classification algorithms we use to, to, to determine different groups. Um, sequential analysis itself, which includes not only looking at individual sequences, but also at the se sequences at the population level, which is what I'll be talking a little bit more about today that Lawrence referred to, um, as well as developing the right kinds of algorithms to look at, at sequential analysis, information theory being one, of one, one very important one. And then also how we're going to use that sequential analysis. Can we actually map those sequences to behavior or behavioral context and or meaning eventually? Um, and then correspondence to meaning, uh, very important. And as I think Lawrence has tried to point out, there, sometimes there's a, a, a confusion between what's information and what's meaning in the entropic sense. So that's something that we should be really clear about as well. So I want to talk a little bit about past approaches. Again, this is the work from the mid to late 1990s. Um, and, so, and first talk a little bit about how we categorize signals um, back then in order to give us a gr greater understanding of, um, of how dolphins might use whistles in sequences. And we base this actually on the perceptual system of the dolphins themselves. So back in the early 1990s, Diana Reese and I did a study in which we um, exposed dolphins to an underwater keyboard, which had essentially um, uh, three uh, uh, underwater keyboard that you see over here on the right with three-dimensional keys that produced computer-generated whistles that were like their whistles in, in some ways, but not exactly like their own whistles, and, and that, that were also um, corresponding to a different object or activity, such as rubbing. And we found, interestingly, that the dolphins spontaneously imitated these, these signals. Uh, we did not train them to do so, as they had been done in other kinds of experiments. And what you're seeing here on the left-hand side is the model sound and some of the in initial imitations that the dolphins produce, like producing the end of the sound first, beginning of sound second, bad approximation of the sound, and then almost a perfect imitation of the whistle itself. And they also began, if you look at the lower panel here, producing spontaneous productions of these as well, not just right after the model sound itself, but during swimming, playing with objects. Um, and we found, which was quite important, is that what the dolphins appeared to do was to conserve the contour, kind of like the signature whistle idea, uh, and also some work that Herman had done earlier. They conserved the, the, the contour of the whistles, but not necessarily the exact frequency time parameters. So we became very interested in trying to get at a quantitative method that would allow us to classify those signals as similar based upon the dolphin's own system of producing them, um, but that would only look at contour itself. Uh, just to mention, we also saw that dolphins tended to use these, these uh, signals either 
combined or in sequence, if you will. Here we have a model sound of the ring sound and a model sound of the ball sound. And here's a production by a dolphin producing a ring and, and a ball sound together uh, and uh, actually produce it in, in appropriate contexts. So the goal then, back then, was to develop some kind of quantitative method that would allow us to categorize these signals into appropriate types based upon this information from the dolphins themselves. And so what we ended up doing was developing a contour categorization technique in which we would uh, measure a correlation matrix of every whistle to every other whistle in the, in the database. We would um, take that correlation matrix, subject it to principal component analysis, and then did a cluster analysis uh, originally k-means cluster analysis and then eventually a, a more of a Bayesian approach to um, categorize signals into, into these whistles into whistle types and then be able to compare them across um, two different individuals and group them into final shared whistle types. And I'd like to point out that um, of course it was very easy to um, categorize different, very different distinctive contours from each other but we subsequently were able to apply this to some more subtle kinds of changes in these, in these what we call rise whistles that were kind of similar to the, some of the things that, that Layla was showing us earlier today and found that we could actually uh, s um, discriminate subtle contours uh, based upon individual identity as well. So we, we definitely can get subtle information with this kind of an approach as well. So let's move on to se sequential analysis now that we have a call categorization system that um, at least uh, at, for, at the time was, was very useful and may continue to be so with, with new techniques. Um, and let's talk a little bit about how we applied those, those uh, signal categories to, to looking at information theory measures. Now, as Lawrence has already pointed out, um, zero order entropy measures the uh, diversity of the repertoire. Um, first order entropy uh, measures the repertoire complexity, if you will, that is there are differences in the degree to which different signals are used in a, in a, in a repertoire. Uh, and zip slope is included in that, which, um, which Ramon's going to talk a little bit more about in a few minutes. And then organizational complexity is trying to look at higher order relationships between the whistles. That is, how important are two signal sequences and dependencies? Or how important are three signal se sequences? And the way that we do that is to develop a measure called entropic slope that allows us to know the degree to which there's more structure in a communication system. So the steeper the slope, the more dependency at higher and higher levels of, of, of entropic order. Um, given, given the caveat that if it's so steep that it's completely rigid, that you don't have much complexity at all because suddenly you have no flexibility. So the idea is that it needs to be balanced between like a flat slope and a really, really steep slope in order for that flexibility to, 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 take, uh, to take place and therefore have uh, uh, things like language. So let's first start out with ZIPS coefficient. Um, we basically plotted the values that we have for human languages uh, and against a, a couple of different other species, again, categorized in different ways uh, for their calls. And what we found is that bottlenose dolphins showed a, a ZIP slope similar to, to languages, a negative one ZIP slope. These are adult dolphins, by the way. Infant dolphins showed a slightly more um, repetitive uh, slope. Uh, and so one of the things that we thought that it may be that zip slope regression coefficient might tell us is something about the potential for communication complexity. Because we have to look at whether or not there's actual sequential information going on in order to know for sure whether or not there is communication complexity. The second um, measure I wanted to talk a little bit about is entropic slope. And this is an idea that we borrowed from Chatfield and Lemon, as I recall. Uh, back in the 1970s. And this is again showing you what I was just describing. We have an entropic value here on the y-axis, the entropic order on the x-axis. And what we have here are regressing Shannon entropies by, the dip, by English letters, Arabic levels, and Russian, uh, Arabic letters and Russian letters, showing you that you can get a slope out of these kinds of measures. And when we plot the actual slopes themselves um, with using Russian, English, and Arabic letters, and then plot Russian phonemes, dolphin whistles, squirrel monkey calls, and ground squirrel calls. What we see is that we have a lot more, we have a lot greater um, entropic slope for these other systems than we do for these letters. And it's because in each of these cases, these um, entropic slopes are undersampled, which would make them more repetitive than they would be if they were properly sampled. 
So we expect that Russian phonemes, once they're properly sampled, would, get, would go up to Russian letters, and also suspect that dolphin whistles might approach something that's more language-like in structure. And here's just an example of, of the population dolphin whistle sequence of showing you the, the, uh, the direction and amount of uh, whistle dependency and sequence in these sequential structures. Now let me just uh, summarize a couple of current findings that we've been w working with with Ramon, um, both in sequential analysis and meaning. And the first of which is um, finding uh, additional evidence for dependencies in whistles in uh, bottlenose dolphins. And this includes doing, I guess, both global and sort of local randomization tests that indicate that dolphins show significant correlations um, reliably up to, up to four whistle sequences and, um, and maybe even as high as seven in some animals. So we're continuing to do this work using different kinds of methodologies in order to look uh, at whistle sequence dependence, and Ramon can tell you more about that. And in addition, um, we've been get, beginning to look at uh, new ways of looking for p uh, potential for meaning in dolphin vocalizations. And this slide just represents that uh, in humans, more frequent words tend to have more, more meanings uh, and this is called the law of meaning. Uh, and what uh, Ramon has found in the work he's been doing very recently is that um, dolphins also show this same pattern. So uh, the more often a whistle is used, um, the more often it occurs, the more often it, is, uh, it, it has a number of behavioral contexts associated with, and that's adjusted for the number of signals analyzed. And this just gives us additional information that, this, that, the, uh, that the structure of dolphin communication might actually be uh, very uh, uh, linked to the meaning. And let me just end then with what I think might be some future approaches. Um, I've recently become involved very much with the network approach, trying to study a number of different kinds of systems well beyond animal and dolphin communication. Uh, and in fact, I've been working with a computational statistician at UC Davis to develop methods that allow us not only to look at predicting social stability in, in rhesus macaque social groups and looking at disease transmission dynamics in African wildlife. But I think that these same kinds of techniques can be used to understand communication complexity. And so let me just briefly mention them, and then we can maybe talk more about them uh, and as the days go, uh, go by. Uh, the first is called data cloud geometry, and this is a network-based approach doing random walks using statistical physics uh, to uh, look at ways to categorize calls using a data-driven approach. So that, that might be of some interest that we've just recently published. Um, a sequential ana analytical method might include percolation and conductance, which we currently have submitted, uh, which is, a, again, another network-based approach to look at flow through systems, which might be a really great way to begin to look at sequential analysis in all kinds of animal vocalizations. And then another and final one that I'd like to mention that we've been using to look at how networks correspond to one another is called joint modeling, um, developed by our, our research group. And this will allow us to ha perhaps take sequences of whistles against behavioral sequences and see how they correspond to one another uh, through a network-based approach. Uh, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it now, but I thought I'd mention these, and we could talk more about them if anybody's interested. So thank you, and I will turn over to Ramon. Thank you.